so much for uh, waiting and uh, thank Sanjay, Neeta, and the entire team of IDEC. Uh, you know, they gave me a topic, which is the, I'm the last batsman in Hall B. I'm happy that you stayed over so that we can travel back together and I'm sure you have taken the rounds today. So, you know, the topic which uh, Neeta allocated to me was, uh, are triglyceride levels responsible for residual cardiovascular risk? And that topic actually has gone through a lot of transformation. And my link with obesity, adiposity, remnant cholesterol, assessment of type 2 diabetes is very different. And that's something which we all recognize. So I think I'm going to talk of that topic very little. And I'm going to talk of adiposity in the cardiovascular conundrum. Then treat LDL cholesterol or remnant cholesterol. That's where actually triglycerides find their place. Then stratify cardiovascular risk. That's where we are moving. And there's a lot of new perspectives, which probably Sanjay and Nita wanted me to discuss, on non-HDL cholesterol, remnant target levels. And then finally, some data, which is emerging on triglycerides, on the residual risk forefront. But the first part is DBCD, and I can see Urmo is here, right here. Our good friend, uh, Jeffrey Mechanic, uh, always talks about this DBCD and adiposity, and defining the cardiovascular risk. And it's all about dysglycemia-based chronic disease now. Uh, in stage one, it's molecular at insulin resistance. Stage two is biochemical and cardiometabolic at prediabetes. Stage three is all about biochemical diabetes. Stage four is all about complications, which are vascular, 4A, 4B, 4 And it's all complex interactions of genome, epigenome, environment. And clearly we know that we need a population-based approach to strike these mechanistic drivers. There's a lot of mitochondrial epigenetics, genes, adiposity, on this whole concept of DBCD or you know, the dysglycemia-based chronic disease. So obviously there is a link between visceral adiposity and atherosclerosis. That's very well documented. And we have a lot of inflammatory adipokines, uh, which some of them are anti-inflammatory, some of them are pro-inflammatory. And they keep on changing. You know, we have omentin, apelin, adiponectin in the protective space. And in the pro-inflammatory space, we have isfatin, ABFPP, resistin, and so on and so forth. And this list keeps on increasing all the time. And have agents really made a difference, anti-diabetic agents on glucose and adiposity control? We don't know, but the data clearly shows that most of the glucose-lowering studies showed mixed results on macrovascular outcomes. And that's partly true because of metabolic memory, and that's probably speculative when I talk about it, but there's some data on suggesting that. And then, of course, came the new blocks on the kit, the SGLT2 inhibitors. They lower A1C with a lit little impact on lipid profile, and they still work. So, so that's something, but that's, I'm certain in the last three days has been discussed a lot by everybody. We also have to consider when we are looking at this whole conundrum of triglycerides as a residual risk, the role of statins. Because whenever there's a residual risk, that residual risk is defined onboarded patients with statin. So do statins really have a role on or control on adiposity? Let's look at the look ahead trial. And we clearly have seen in that that intensive lifestyle intervention focused on weight loss did not improve cardiovascular risk in type 2 diabetes in long term. So that data is clear cut. You know, if you look at the AVCSD risk as by the calculator, clearly we see that data is negative. It's not very, very compelling and positive. But the slides shown by the industry is predominantly the LDL lowering effect on benefit of statins. And these are all the primary and secondary trials. And in that space, if you look at it, despite of statinization of the world, we still see that residual risk. And clearly we see that on statin trials, on 10-year risk on major CVD endpoints, on primary prevention, we see around 8 to 35% relative risk reduction. This is a summary of HPS diabetes cards, Aspen 1 prime, and Escort diabetes. And when you look at secondary prevention, it's around 13 to 50% relative risk reduction, whether it's 4S diabetes, HPS diabetes, Aspen, KR diabetes, TNT diabetes. So that's the summary that despite of all this, there will be a residual risk which will be left over after statinization. So when you look at Statin therapy also, there is a new term which was introduced almost a decade back in the United States called intensive lipid lowering therapy. And as we talk today, next week the Lipid Association of India is in Delhi when RSS is there celebrating its 50 years. And they are also you know, debating and debating this, that is there still a residual risk? The first trial which put Simva statin in the NICE guidelines in UK in NHS was the forest trial. 
That's almost 20 years old now. Then came CARE, then came Lipid, then came HPS, then came TNT. But there is still, after a decade of statinization, in diabetes, after intensive lipid lowering, a degree of residual risk. And that residual risk is there. So here's the data. And we have now divided our lipid therapies, of lipid lowering therapies, in different groups. You know, high intensity statin monotherapy, moderate intensity statin monotherapy. Then of course we have the azetamide. Then of course the PCSK9s have come in. And of course we have the low intensity statins. And even if you achieve 2016 goal, 19 goal, with established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, you will still see a residual risk. And you can see the data here on the slide, anywhere ranging from 8% to 67%. So it's a very big clutter there. What is responsible for it? Is it the triglyceride? Is it the LDL cholesterol? Is it the remnant cholesterol which is driving that atherosclerotic vascular risk? And that data is now available. It's emerged in 2020. And this is a very nice editorial comment I would ask all of you all to read that what is remnant cholesterol? It's nothing but total cholesterol minus HDL cholesterol minus LDL cholesterol. And it really corresponds to a risk which remains. So if you look at remnant cholesterol, lipoprotein little a, for which we understand precious little about, and ApoB, all the three are determinants of atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk. And a 30 milligram per deciliter increase on non-HDL resulted in 19% increase in cardiovascular mortality compared to 15% on LDL cholesterol. So that data has also emerged very clearly. And if you look at remnant cholesterol levels more than 30, they were clearly able to identify or stratify those individuals with high risk of MACE events, independent of LDL cholesterol. So that's really the overarching philosophy that you have that so-called non-HDL cholesterol emerging as a AVCSD risk, clearly there. And this is that big data, which uh, Raman Puri, who's the head and founder of, uh, who's a cardiologist from US who migrated back to India, uh, put out on the uh, Lipid Association of India, the meta-analysis of more than 62,154 patients that in treated on eight trials, 4S, ASCAPs, lipids, CARS, TNT, IDL, SPARC, Jupiter, revealed that one standard deviation increase in LDL cholesterol, ApoB or non-HDL cholesterol, increased the cardiovascular event risk by 13, 14 and 16 percent respectively. So that's something which is very, very compelling. And if you look at, and when you put this through the filter of multivariate analysis of risk for all-cause mortality and myocardial infarction on statin-treated patients, and the best data is available from Scandinavia, from the Copenhagen general population study, clearly you can see the discordant values. See the discordance here in this. And this clearly reflects the residual risks. And you can see that residual risk exists despite of statinization. So if you see that risk is driven predominantly by non-HDL ApoB, and that's something we need to recognize, and there is still a risk of myocardial infarction and all-cause mortality. So that's something very, very clear. So ApoB got into the spotlight. So if you have to identify somebody with residual risk, either it's ApoB or non-HDL cholesterol, is it just a triglyceride? We don't know. I will come back to it a little later. That's why I said with Nita's permission, I wanted to dive, deep dive what's happening today in 2020, 2021, 2022. And if you see that residual risk profile, in the discordant analysis, it clearly shows ApoB is the most accurate marker. And the threshold for ApoB as a risk modifier in statin-treated patients particularly should be closer to 92 than 130. That's the overarching thing. So keep your LDL as close as possible. So eventually it all came to risk stratification. And everybody got their own calculator. In India, we still need to generate Indian science to generate its Indian calculator, but it's all about this. It's all about predicting atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk. So if you want to predict incident atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk in Indians with traditional risk models, based on Western population risk profile data, it is a challenge. Because we all know 
that Framingham risk score predicts and overestimates in Asian population who have a lower incidence of coronary artery disease. And it also shows a disproportionately high incidence of stroke. So this is very clear that in the Indian population, if you apply the Framingham risk, you will over magnify stroke, under magnify coronary artery disease. That data is now available. Also, if you apply the 2013 ACCHA pool cohort, clearly we see that the incidence of cardiovascular disease in Asian Americans, that data is available right from friends like Alka Kanayaga's group, the Masala study, and various others, including NSA and us, who are all migrant Indians, second generation living in the United States. Clearly, what we have seen from that data, and this was compiled, of course, by Durai Raj, that in South Asians, the coronary artery disease is more extensive, more intense, and more adverse in outcomes. We have some retrospective data to show that JBS3 is performed best in people with multiple risk factors. So we all know this risk calculator came out in 2019 from the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association. Clearly you know that you can look at each age group below 19, 20 to 40, 40 to 75 and above 75. And clearly triage people in high risk, intermediate risk, borderline risk and low risk. And I don't want to go into the AVCID risk enhancers in this population because we all know this. People with family history of premature atherosclerotic vascular disease, persistent elevation on LDL, chronic kidney disease, metabolic syndrome, which is very prevalent in our country, and our own South Asian ancestry obviously becomes the risk enhancer. So clearly, from that standpoint, it's clear cut. So if you look at models, including the Framingham model, on diabetes and incident diabetes in adults, Clearly, we can actually give points now. And Wilson et al. put out this paper quite some time back, almost 14 years back, on fasting glucose gets 10 points. BMI 25 to 29 gets 2 points. BMI above 30 gets 5 points. HDL below, men and women have a difference at 5 points. Parental history of diabetes get 3 points. Triglycerides above 150 came 3 points. That's where triglyceride comes down. So I'm sorry I've started my triglyceride story a little late. But triglyceride is nothing but an epiphenomenon of triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, and it's all linked to our carb intake. And of course, hypertension comes up right up there. And then, of course, as I said, Kerala data from uh, Pauline Paul has very clearly shown on the JBS3, which was published in 2020, that if you look at lifetime cardiovascular risk score on a large pool of population or intermediate 10-year risk score in our population, there's a risk continuum. In Indians, there is a risk continuum. We, we see this risk continuum. And therefore, if you compare all the risk scores, whether you take UKPDS, Framingham risk score, atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk engine, the GBS3 score, age is there, gender is there, BMI is only there in the Indian component, ethnicity, we don't know, we don't have adequate data. And then whether triglycerides come there, anything else comes there, we don't know. So there are a lot of ifs and buts in these scoring patterns. And obviously the endpoints which are studied also, the high-risk cutoff changes, UKPDS was more than 10%, Framingham was more than 20%, atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk engine was more than 10%, JBS3 was more than 20%. And cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, angina, revascularization, fatal non-fatal stroke, TIA, intermittent coronation, and heart failure. Now, our SGLT trials only focused on predominantly the heart failure as a elephant in the room with some non-fatal MI and angina, and then they, they moved out. If you look at the old proactive trial, and we have Dr. Panikar here, if you look at pioglitazone data, they had data even on the stroke, which was removed. So, you know, the cardiovascular endpoints kept on changing, and so did the scores. And therefore, when we look at recommendations for risk stratification, probably the JBS3 risk calculator to estimate 10-year risk for residual risk still is pretty certain. Total cholesterol and non-HDL from a non-fasting sample can be used. Non-HDL instead of LDL may be a little more compelling. And people who are at residual risk are people who are diabetic, above 40, probably with CKD and family history, and our own Asian ancestry, clearly dead. So obviously we need to reduce that risk reduction, and that, that data is available. We have the adopt data to show with cluster analysis that we need tight glucose control. So we need to connect the dots.
we clearly need to connect the dots of vascular complications with insulin resistance due to adiposity that drive the metabolic comp complications of cardiovascular risk. We clearly know insulin resistance has endothelial dysfunction, a lot of excess sympathetic nervous system activity. I saw Anita was rushing here because this program had run before time. So it's all our sympathetic response, you know, glomerular hypertension, renin angiotensin activation, leading to micro and macrovascular complications. Clearly, here comes triglycerides. Triglycerides and remnant cholesterol and not LDL or not HDL cholesterols are associated with a MACE outcome, which is adverse. And its first inclination came from observational analysis. And I'm sure you all know the ready-made prevention diet trial. It came from lifestyle. And we clearly know remnant cholesterol carried VLDL, IDL, contributed by atherosclerotic risk from the Copenhagen general population study participants. We also know that currently in the real world, achieving a non-fasting, non-HDL target along with LDL is a feasible strategy to mitigate risk in our population. That's a feasible strategy. And that's why the Lipid Association of India recommends do a non-HDL. It's a much more accurate predictor, particularly in people with diabetes who have high triglycerides. So that's where triglyceride comes in the focus, and that's why probably Nita and Sanjay wanted me to discuss this topic in diabetic people, obese persons, who are already on a statin because they have that residual risk. And that's the importance. And now she's starting a cardiac hospital, I'm told, in Belgao. So obviously she needs to recognize re residual risk because, you know, that's where the reversal can start of atherosclerotic disease. Non-HDL is as important as LDL for lipid lowering therapy. And monitoring of non-HDL does not require a fasting sample and takes care of both the LDL and triglyceride targets. And in all individuals, non-HDL should be kept below 30. So that's also clearly there. We know that ATP3, Scott Grundy's data from NCP showed, and they recommended use of non-HDL for achieving LDL and triglycerides if triglycerides are more than 200. In our population, triglycerides are always about 200. And that's why JBS3 recommends on the consensus, which was the Indian consensus with Raman Puri led as a group, clearly showed that non-HDL should be the preference to LDL in the lipid lowering therapy. And we had done our own uh, with Dr. Mohan, ICMR and DAB. I was in charge of the lipid cohort that time. And NICE recommended non-HDL by 40% on lipid-lowering drug for secondary prevention. So did the US, so did the International Atherosclerotic Society. So clearly serum triglycerides are right up there. They are the first biomarker which we recognize to see that because we don't do non-HDL all the time. And they do serve as a residual risk factor in atherosclerotic disease patients with optimal medical therapy. And therefore strictly maintaining your triglyceride levels is necessary for optimal management of coronary artery disease. So obviously that's what she told me to talk on and that's where the data is. So circulating triglycerides are the current focus on residual risk. And this is the FMD J study A data, clearly recognizing that, that if you are low normal triglyceride below 100, high normal 100 to 149, borderline 150 to 199, moderate hypertriglyceridemia. And they looked at outcomes between triglycerides and first CV events, first onset, death from CV disease, non-fatal acute coronary syndrome, non-fatal stroke, and coronary artery disease, and followed them up for three years. And the Kaplan mirror was clear cut. Okay, clearly it showed that serum triglyceride above 100 was associated with increased risk of first major CV events compared to people who were below 100. So that data is clear cut beyond reasonable doubt. So I don't think we should have in our thinking that triglycerides are not important, they are important, and they can predict and 100 is the key number. It's not 150, it's not 200. So in clinical practice, strict attention should be there both on lowering serum triglycerides as much as LDL to really prevent atherosclerotic residual risk in coronary artery disease patients. And this is the data which was published in April 2019 in circulation showing triglycerides as a residual risk in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And this is how the first major cardiovascular events, because it's all about outcomes. That's how the kaplan mirrors separate out very clearly. And this is a more cluttered slide. This slide is just not meant to check your eyesight, but it only shows you that whether it's non-fatal coronary artery syndrome or stroke or coronary artery disease or hospitalization of heart failure or death from all causes, there is a link with triglycerides. Don't ignore it. Don't get carried. I know we have a Westerner in our audience as our ADA president. Don't get carried away by that because our data might be a little different. And we need to recognize triglycerides still 
And now the world, cardiology world, at least in the US, is recognizing that. They're recognizing that for various hazards ratios, when you adjust it, there is a link between triglycerides and first major cardiovascular outcome. So that data is clear cut. So initially they were skeptical. Now that data is coming there. It's coming up on the guidelines as well. And if you look at American Heart's journal, you know, original triglyceride research in the KP REACH study, better data came out in October 2021. And clearly, Goh's group showed, uh, you know, Alan Goh's group very clearly showed that triglyceride re levels have a linkage and remain the highest residual risk markers, probably as a causal role on cardiovascular events, whether it's deaths, all-cause hospitalizations, major, major cardiovascular events, so on and so forth. And that data is pretty compelling. That cohort which they recognized, which was published, had a clear-cut hazard ratio. And despite of receiving statin therapies, elevated TG levels were associated with more atherosclerotic cardiovascular events and lower risk of death. Clearly, that data is available. Again, a cluttered slide. I don't want to get there. So obviously, what it taught us, triglyceride levels decreased with age, were lower in non-Hispanic Africans, higher in Hispaniacs, as well as Asian and Pacific Islanders, compared to non-Hispanic white patients. So that data is clear cut now. That's, that's something which we recognize from that study, at least for the US population. And clearly, it also recognizes that elevated TGs increase major adverse cardiovascular events, decrease risk of death, and the established cardiovascular disease. So clinically, triglycerides function as a surrogate for atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk, as well as a biomarker for nutritional or carb status. And therefore, if you want that additional risk reduction strategy, and you further want to improve that residual risk reduction outcome, you need to look at it and not ignore it. And that data keeps coming up. You know, from Brigham, uh, Frank Sachs and his group also published this data, again recognizing the same thing in American Journal of Cardiology. Again, very clear-cut data, control study, high TGs have a role. So obviously there is evidence to suggest that higher triglycerides are a marker of cardiovascular risk and may help you to identify people who might benefit from intensification. But we still don't know much about genomics of triglyceride-rich lipoproteins and cardiovascular disease. That's an area of research. So probably what we have learned today, and I know this is the last talk and I'm between lunch and all of us, is that there is a role for raised triglycerides and remnant cholesterol. And it's linked to intimal low-grade inflammation and atherosclerosis development. And that's what this illustration tells us. And clearly triglycerides and remnant cholesterol act through triglyceride hydrolysis and cholesterol accumulation in the arterial wall foam cells. And that's what leads to atherosclerosis. And there's enough epidemiological evidence to suggest that they have markers of risk. There's additional information now available that despite of statin therapy, they are a residual risk marker. There is enough data now to suggest that they have independent association for future cardiovascular events, though this is a little controversial in the US world. And now there is emerging evidence from the genomic standpoint, epigenomic standpoint, where probably we'll understand better on serum triglycerides and causal pathways. So that's something which we'll recognize in times to come. So as I said, we need to connect the dots. And that's where adiposity, metabolic complications, vascular health, carbs which we eat in our foods, triglycerides, all get linked. So don't miss out on the remnant cholesterol and triglyceride because they have an impact on the MACE outcomes and therefore they are a residual risk factor. Triglyceride levels are a residual risk factor and that's the only point which probably Neeta and Sanjay wanted me to tag and their entire group. Congratulations for this wonderful show. This is a fantastic auditorium and a fantastic venue. I really enjoyed it. Okay, thank you so much.